coming out, but most of the plants aren't quite ready yet. And this plant next door is certainly alive, but it has not started shooting up the precious nutrients and resources that it's been saving in its roots mainly during the winter. It's going to wait now, and in the next few weeks, it's going to invest them up into the leaves and branches of the tree, as will a lot of the trees around us here. Some of them still have a few leaves that survived the winter miraculously, but the majority of the trees have been plucked by the animals. All the leaves have simply fallen off, but that will change. And where I'm standing now, and you can see me, in a few weeks' time, you won't be able to see me if I'd be standing here. This is going to be completely thick and overcrowded with leaves. And our job of finding animals is going to become trickier. But like I said earlier, I think one of my theories as to why we still manage to find animals in the very thick conditions in the summer is that they may stick to the roads more often and stick to the open areas. And that kind of makes sense because, just like us, animals try and take the path of least resistance. In winter, you can walk around anywhere, be it even we can, the animals can, without getting snagged up and caught on things. But in summer, when everything's thick, you can't even see where you're standing because the grass is so long, it becomes a different story. So that's why I think we still manage to find animals in the, in the summer. I'm sure a lot of you must be wondering what James and Brent are up to. And there's only one way to find out, and that's to head on across to them. So enjoy, and I wish I was coming along to see what they are doing as well. And we'll see you a little bit later. Hey everybody, welcome back to this magnificent sky tree, Kosia bracula, or the weeping bean. Now, what is interesting about this tree, well, there are a number of interesting things about it, but first, and my colleague, Brian Smith, and I don't understand the content of this, of course, but apparently bark can be used to cure a hover. I mean, I don't know if hover feels, so I wouldn't know that that is true or not. Uh, so sorry about the audio, apparently it is breaking up slightly, um, so breaking up is this thing here, called a bracket fungus, and the bracket fungus likes to grow in moist, wet areas at the base of these trees, and also on trees that have a fairly soft heartwood, in a wood that is eaten out by things such as border beetles. Yes, indeed, the wicked fungus is not edible, fairly disgusting, and, and apparently we've had a question about land snails. Welcome back, everyone. And this long-tailed shark has just made a kill. It's got a scorpion. Look at this. Incredible. It's difficult to see very clearly, but you can see the sting of the scorpion hanging down. You can also see the pincers. I can't tell what kind of scorpion it is. It's a bit too far away. And look, it's going for the sting now. It's trying to get rid of the dangerous end. Lucky bird though, tasty breakfast. Swallowed. Job done. Just like that, he swallowed the whole scorpion hole. Imagine having a scorpion wriggling around in your belly. Well, that's what this long-tailed shrike is experiencing at the moment. And it looked like I got a kind of good enough glimpse to, to say that I think it's a hairy, th uh, not a hairy thick-tailed scorpion. A lot of the common well, a lot of the scorpions don't actually have common names, but that one didn't look highly venomous. It had quite big pincers, and it looked like an Epistothalmus glabifrons, which is the same scorpion that VM spotted just the other day. Let me 
is just making sure its beak is nice and clean. And that scorpion that we did spot the other day, or VM spotted it, was on the ground. And they do move around. And maybe this shrike got lucky and saw the scorpion doing some housekeeping around its excavation or burrow. This specific scorpion that it just ate lives in burrows in the sand. A lot of the other scorpions will live in the cracks of the bark and trees. And not our first scorpion that we've seen being We got to see the white-tailed mongoose eats a scorpion. Well, glad we managed to rush you back from James and Brent just in time. Still fine-tuning that equipment and trying to get it working as well as we can. Still experiencing some audio issues, which I thought you, uh, I think you guys got a, a, a little taster of there. But isn't it fun to just be able to show you guys a different perspective and a few different angles on this experience, even if the audio isn't perfect. We're certainly not going to settle for that, but for now, I think it's great that you can be involved in this whole process and then we'll all really be able to appreciate the equipment when it is working 100%, which hopefully won't take our tech wizards too much longer to work out. Well, the morning of... which hopefully won't take our tech wizards too much longer to work out. Not often that we get to see so many kills or action taking place like that. Good to have you with us and Molly would like to know whether we have the olive frog out here and not that I know of but I do need to go through the frog book now that it's frog season again and refresh my rusty memory but it doesn't ring a bell there is a host of different frogs and toads that we will get to show you over the coming months and not only that Molly but the chameleons that you asked after are also going to be starting to move around now and they're going to become a lot easier for us to see and the best time and most likely time for us to spot them is actually at night with the spotlight during the day I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this to you I think there's an option here or an opportunity to hear. Yeah. Basically, during the day, if a chameleon was in a bush like this behind me, it would blend in very, very well with the colors using its camouflage abilities and the abilities to be able to alter its colors depending on the substrate that it's on. So if it was in this bush, it would be green. If it crossed the road, they go a yellow color. So they can't always match the exact background of where they are. Some chameleons can, but the flap neck can't quite do it exactly right. But they will be able to change from a green color to a yellow color as they cross the road. But during the day, it's very, very difficult to see them unless they are crossing a road. And even then, a lot of people don't see them and squish them. But during at nighttime with the spotlight, what you'd be looking for is something like the color of this one leaf here. So this one leaf is just a slightly paler shade to the rest of a slightly lighter shade so it's essentially a dead leaf with the shape of a chameleon and the chameleons if you're looking at a side profile have got a very distinct pose and posture with their head and body and their tails all curled up 
like a sausage, like a Swiss roll. So if you get that side profile of a dead leaf, coloration, the shape of a chameleon, you know you're in luck. And it's something that often astonishes guests when astonishes guests when they are out here on safari, and you can be driving very quickly and spot the tiniest of little chameleons. They will be hatchlings this big soon. And there'll also be much larger ones, the adults that we get to see. So we'll be able to show you a host of different sizes, but all the same species, all the flap neck chameleon here. But you can imagine driving along in the dark, all of a sudden your guide jams on brakes, reverses, and reveals this tiny chameleon. And people cannot understand how on earth you've seen them, but it's actually quite easy. And guides get a lot of un undue credit for spotting a chameleon and the hard work that the track and guide have done tracking and finding a leopard can often be kind of seen as the norm but your spotting of the chameleon is the highlight of your guest stay which is actually quite frustrating because it requires no skill well not no skill but not as much skill as tracking down a leopard anyway that's just some interesting kind of behind the scenes of what us guides get up to and you naturally ride the wave and act like you are the greatest thing on earth for spotting whatever you have the greatest eyes on earth for spotting this chameleon and you don't necessarily tell them how easy it is but I guess that depends on the guide and depends on the specific set of guests Enjoying the fact that a lot of you are showing a keen interest on a lot of the smaller critters that we have seen and are going to see. And Spusisu, aka the Black Mamba, in Hermann's Kraus, as one of our South African viewers, would, well, he's pointed out that scorpions and snakes are venomous. You are 100% correct, Spusisu. Where you've gone wrong is that you've then said they are therefore poisonous. And then how can that bird that we've just seen eat a scorpion without becoming intoxicated? And the reason is in the words that you've used. Venom has to be injected into your bloodstream. And that's why you use the word venomous for things that can sting you and that can bite you. And you were, use the word poisonous for things that you can ingest. So poison needs to be eaten in order for it to affect you. You can pour poison over your skin and nothing will necessarily happen. It, it does depend, but basically poison needs to be swallowed. Venom needs to be injected. And that's why that long-tailed shrike could feed on the scorpions, sting and all, without worrying about having any negative effects. And it's the same for the snake eagles or any of the birds of prey or animals that eat snakes. You can even drink the venom of snakes, provided you've got no abrasions or cuts in your mouth. It shouldn't and won't have any effect on you. So, that I'm sure is not only cleared it up for you, Spusiso, but for a lot of people, they often get venom and poison confused and use the words synonymously i don't know if that's 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 the correct word to use but they are certainly not synonyms they're two very different things now we are approaching the small squill that's a plant that grows from a bulb and it shoots up an arm with flowers or a branch with flowers coming out of it and you get lots of different types of Squills. The one squirrel that we'll get to see is the tall white squirrel. This one is a cousin that we haven't been able to identify exactly which one it is. But as part of our research, we actually dug one of them up whilst we were on tracking team. James and myself, we were tracking a leopard and got distracted. And then all of a sudden we were sitting down 
digging like little children with sticks. And so we managed to excavate a bulb about the size of an apple. And it's going to be quite nice to show you what is above the ground now that we know what is below. Now, where is this little squirrel? There's one here somewhere. It's right at the entrance to some of the accommodation where half of our crew stay, the other half stay not too far away. Here it is. So I'm just going to jump out. And this is a certain sign of spring. We've only noticed them popping up very recently. And isn't it interesting how this shoot comes up from, like I said, quite a large bulb that's probably about six inches under the ground. And out from that bulb pops this pretty little stalk. Sadly, the flowers aren't open at the moment, but all of these little buds will open up into little flowers, and we'll be able to show you more of them. There's quite a few around various parts of the reserve. But also a very clear sign of the springtime. I just heard Craig trying to get a hold of me earlier. He probably wants an update as to where we left Madiba, so I'm just going to be giving him a quick chat, an update, Craig for Scott. No negative, I left about 25 minutes ago. Um, if you drive along Gowrie Main towards the signboards, you'll see my vehicle tracks coming off road, probably about 50 meters east of the signboards. And then if you just follow them back in, he was lying up on a prominent termite farm in a Tamboti thicket. The visual was, was pretty good if he's in the same place, but tricky to get in there. Oh, quickly, Jandre, there's some Impala shooting across. It's a bit of a gamble. But always nice to show you the animals jumping for joy. And at least we got a glimpse of those impala shooting off. Oh, here comes some more, Jandre. And I'm telling you, this is the weather and the fact that these impala know life is good. The green grass is on the way. And I certainly would also be celebrating if I was an impala. We did go past a herd earlier that were literally pronking and jumping, and you could imagine being a herbivore and only having this very dry grass to feed on. For months on it, it's been an incredibly dry season, drier than normal. There goes Eugene. Our tech wizard. Morning, Eugenie. Morning. And he's such a wonderful man. We're so lucky to have him around. He doesn't like being in front of the camera, so he's going to remain anonymous for a lot of you. But we'll try and sneak the odd picture of him that we'll add onto the tweets. But he is a pivotal member of our team who, just because you don't get to see him or hear him speak very often, or hear his name necessarily, that's not to say that he is not a wonderful member of our team. And the amount of problems that he has to solve on a daily basis is astonishing. And very often he'll just be at the verge of finishing one problem, and then somebody will appear out of the shadows and tap him on the shoulder and say, Eugene, when you finished here, we've got another problem for you to come and solve. Andre spotted a troop of vervet monkeys up ahead, so let's see if we can catch up to them. They're an animal we don't get to show you very often. And they're running past our old fireside chat spots. Which is just up to the left here. It's not an old fireside chat spot, it is the fireside chat spot. 
Uh, let's see if we can get you a view of these monkeys. Now, interestingly, they're trying to hide from us, but there's some here and some in this marula tree, so I'm going to leave it up to Jandre. Okay, we're going to cut to James. We're going to crash cut to James quickly. Hello, everybody. We're back with uh, the Mahindra, and we're looking at some dronga. I think I have everything it looks to me. Uh, they may, of course, be involved in that other ugly, violent activity, the mating. But I'm not really sure. Brent, what do you think they're doing? I think they're definitely the one that really got its upper hand. It's almost the, when I was looking through the lens, they looked like grabbed um, the other's tongue almost and, and had its beak inside the beak. Um, you guys, we can't see what the camera is seeing, but it is very much around the face of the stronger that's on the ground. This looks to be a very serious fight. Yes, it certainly does. It looks positively vicious. Uh, not quite like WWE fighting. This is very genuine violence taking place in front of us. And I suspect it's because we're heading towards spring. Well, we're in the spring now. And obviously the competition for territory, female is going to be that much heavier. But, I mean, this looks like it could result in death almost. Now, the one on the bottom yeah. does look like he's, he's running out of a bit of steam. Mm. And the guy on top doesn't look he's about to let up either. Yeah. It is quite disturbing, I must say. It's not... Um, well, one doesn't like to see too much violence, I suppose from birds which I suppose we tend to think of as uh, sweet song songsters of the morning rather than vicious killers of them see in this check with your just see if it kind of blood damage but I can see it's it's the one on top has literally almost got it by the throat I can't see the color so similar that you can completely see where one starts and ends. There we go. Get away. Oh, no, no, from top. Everybody, if the picture is a bit stable, it's because there's fairly heavy gale blowing, and second, we set this up very far, so it's not Veer is holding it. Clearly, he does have the hands of a surgeon. Energy being used there is 
astonishing. Now, if I was a little gab or dog or a sparrow or something like that, I would come and commit a little drunk as The one is definitely I think it's bigger. Maybe a bit bigger. Hmm. And probably it oh. Oh, over. gone. No no, here we go. Well I'm quite glad that that's ended, I must say I've that quite a distressing to watch. It's, um, vice, of course, is a way of life, and we're just trying a new thing with the microphone, and I'm now, I feel like I'm a reporter coming to you live from Beirut uh, during the uh, conflict there, and where we have just watched the violence, of course, the um, drongos as the humans were fighting with each other there in Lebanon at that time. Hello. Hello, James. Will they fight to the death, do you think? This is a question from Anna Marie Brent. Well, I think uh, given the opportunity, they would. And I actually thought might be a death this, this morning. But fortunately for the smaller, it seemed Drongo that was on the it to escape. Uh, I thought those losers towards the end started sounding like submiss submissive noises. It changed from that to sort of a, like, it sounded like a, a, a dismissive call rather than that initial aggressive call that we were in. Lots of comment Twitter, I'm um, missing a couple of names, our comments are a little bit difficult, to, but um, you said it looked as if the larger one gone for the throat, absolutely it looked like they'd gone for the throat, and then it looked like they were going for various parts of the body as well. Uh, we had the throat, they were attacking the, the beak, so just... I think it looked to me like the subdominant one was holding onto the dominant one's beak so that it could stop it grabbing at the throat. Um, and I think there probably we... a territorial dispute. Have a look at Brent's camera here. There we've got a, a shot of them beak to beak. But fascinating. Right, <laughs> But fa fascinating, I've never seen a Drongo fight go and on that long and with that yeah. much aggression. Brent will post this on Twitter and hashtag Safari Live because Brent is a very good tweeter. Um, and, I mean, you do see Drongos quite a lot. I mean, they fight, they bomb other birds quite a lot. They bomb all the eagles, they bomb owls, pearl-spotted owls, and probably they clearly not bomb each other. A very, very aggressive little bird. But I mean, that was an unbelievably fascinating interlude. And definitely not something James and I have seen before in our past years in the bush. Yes. So, and on that note, we're going to send you back across to Scotty. And hopefully, before the end of drive, we might be able to find some something else interesting. Something perhaps a little less violent. See you just now. Some cuddled, cuddly bears. Like this microphone. Microphone. Welcome back everyone and and 
Isn't it wonderful how we often get surprised out here? Getting to share new experiences and moments with all of you. As you can see, Jandre and myself have not moved from the place where you left, left us. And these three vervet monkeys are enjoying the vantage point from their perch high up in a jackalberry tree. Oh, what am I saying, a jackalberry tree? Apologies. An apple leaf tree. And it looks like they're also enjoying not only the view from up there as they scan their heads around, but also the morning sunshine. You can tell that it's quite breezy and it's a cool breeze. Some leftover effects from the cold front that brought us that much needed rain a few days ago. Great, well we're gonna leave these monkeys to their own devices and I'm gonna actually take you to a spot where we had one of our best sightings of a black mamba, which is probably the most venomous and dangerous snake we encounter out here in the Sabi Sands. Its venom is highly neurotoxic, so it attacks your nervous system and basically your organs will shut down, causing you to die. The good news is if you do have a good first aider around, they, as long as oxygen is kept pumped through your body, you can be revived with life support systems. So if you are bitten by a black mamba, just tell people to keep the oxygen pumping through your body, and that way you can stay alive. And the way that people would do that is through CPR. So that'll be the best way to keep somebody alive if they are bitten by a black mamba. And the sighting that unfolded was in this big maroon tree to our left. And I'm just going to park a bit the vehicle in a good spot where I can explain exactly how the sighting unfolded. We did have a few other sightings of black mamba, probably the same one in this clearing or the same pair. They are territorial snakes. Gonna stop here and talk you through what happened. So basically, what happened was is it was myself and Romeo or Jason, one of the other cameramen who is studying at university now. We heard some virtual starlings alarm calling, and they were alarm calling in this tree. I'm just gonna go around you now. So they were up in this small jackalberry tree and they were alarm calling and looking down into this area. Now, it was in the summer months, early uh, last, uh, early this year, and at that stage there was a carpet of green vegetation about this high. So not very high at all, and for me, I would have thought you'd be able to see a snake slithering through, at least the movements of the snake slither slithering through this short layer of green undergrowth only about four inches high and we got a glimpse of the snake initially and it was somewhere around here and as i was searching in this area and jason was zoomed in on this area where we last saw the snake i was standing on the bonnets of the vehicle looking down we couldn't see anything there and then out the corner of our eye we noticed that the snake had moved to here and we sadly didn't get to film it but the virtual starling was actually flying above the snake and out of the corner of the eye, we saw the snake shoot up out of the grass and strike at the virtual starling, which was flying above it. And then that helped us detect exactly where it was. And from here, we followed the snake. It slithered up into this tree. And then if you go further up this tree, It slithered into this hole. And that was the last glimpse we got of it. 
I hope it's not in here now, but this is where the Black Mamba went. Oh. I'm not sure where my earpiece went. Oh, here it is. <coughs> so, that was an interesting sighting we had of one of the most dangerous snakes we get in this area. Hopefully we'll be able to get to show you a few more in these summer months. And who knows, maybe it will be in that same very hole that I was just poking my finger into. Okay. The last station, go again, please. And Anna Marie has just asked a wonderful question she's interested to know if a snake eagle is big enough to handle a black mamba and yes most certainly i wouldn't say a fully grown big black mamba because they can be three meters in length and about this thick so that's going to be too big for a brown snake eagle or its cousin, the black-chested snake eagle, which we do see here from time to time. The snake eagles prefer snakes of anywhere up to about six feet in length, I would say, would be the absolute maximum size for the snake eagles. Anything bigger than that, they wouldn't be able to swallow, and they swallow the snakes hole head first and once i had an incredible sighting we came across this brown snake eagle and it had caught a boom slung which is also a highly venomous snake thankfully thankfully for us as humans they don't pose too much of a risk because they are back fanged so they would battle to bite onto you and they almost have to chew their prey to get the venom in anyway highly venomous snake the boom slung or tree snake which the name directly translates from afrikaans or dutch into english boom meaning tree and slung meaning sl snake anyway this brown snake eagle was finishing off a male boom slung the males have got a bright green coloration and i could only see about this much of the tail sticking out of the brown snake eagle's mouth and it just had i mean you could imagine it probably had probably three or four feet of snake in its stomach and just about six inches remaining to swallow and the snake wrapped its tail over the brown snake eagle's head and then down underneath its chin or its beak and latched that final part of its tail so it went out the left hand side of its beak straight over the head and then latched on and the snake eagle could not get this tiny little bit of tail untangled over its head but eventually it somehow managed to get that last bit in and swallow it but it took it quite some time and imagine how uncomfortable it must be having that long line of snake all the way into your stomach with the last little bit like a piece of spaghetti tied around your head that you can't undo or, or swallow and monica and liz Happy to hear you were one step ahead and asking already if we do see secretary birds. And we do. Arethusa airstrip's the best place to see them. I've had quite a few sightings there. And it's the bird on the bottom right here. It's got very long legs. And this beautiful tuft of feathers that come off its head. And that's how they get their name. A multitude of pens sticking out of their hair, but that's why it got its name. And with those incredibly long legs, 
What it does is it walks along, so it hunts by walking. It can fly from A to B, of course, but it walks through big open clearings, lizards, rats, insects, but they are snake hunting specialists and have got this incredible ability to, with extreme accuracy and speed, unleash those long legs and stamp down onto snakes' heads. That's another snake-eating raptor. But a lot of the eagles, even if they a lot of the eagles, even if they aren't specialist snake hunters like the snake eagles, they will also feed on snakes. Owls I've seen with snakes, spotted eagle owls, varose eagle owls. So the snakes are on the menu. Dangerous cuisine, but still fed on by a multitude of different birds as well as mammals.